everyone to our second day of papers at the sixth biennial Hamid bin Khalifa Symposium on Islamic Art and Culture. We're very happy to see you all back. That's always a good sign that the first day was good if everybody shows up again. I thought it was terrific. I learned a lot yesterday. I enjoyed it. Although I have to say for some of us, jet lag does kick in a little bit in the afternoon and we find ourselves going, oh, where am I? <laughs> Let me remind you again, no cell phones or please turn off your cell phones if you can. Also, we did find a cell phone here. If anybody left one, a black cell phone, I have it in my bag here. Uh, it seems to have German and French on it and it's locked so we can't open it and, and just phone whoever it is. So if you lost your cell phone, we have it. So please come up. Um, let me just tell you, we have four papers this morning. We'll have two before the break and then a break, two more, and then lunch. Then we have a fairly long break at lunch and we will reconvene in the afternoon for our final paper, which is a calligraphy um, by a contemporary calligrapher, Nasser Salim. So that should be a really exciting paper. We'll have a discussion after that, and then we'll have a final reception at the end. So it's another busy day. Uh, some of the speakers and fellows have asked, is there special time to see the museum? No, you're going to have to give up one of your extra coffee breaks or cut your lunch short and um, head out if you want to see the museum. Today is your day to see it because tomorrow the museum is closed. So today is it and it stays open until 5.30. So you have lots of time and in fact, it's, it's so rich, you might want to take a couple of short visits rather than try to do one whole sweep through. With that, let me introduce our first introducer. Today we have VC students from VCU in Virginia who are going to again introduce our speakers. So our first introducer is going to be Sarah Kleinman. So Sarah, let's welcome. Okay. Hello and welcome. My name is Sarah Kleinman and I am a second year art history graduate student in the curatorial MA PhD program at VCU. It is with great enthusiasm that I introduce Dr. Jonathan Bloom, who has co-organized the Hamad bin Khalifa Symposium since 2004. Dr. Bloom shares the Hamad bin Khalifa Endowed Chair, Endowed Chair of Islamic Art at VCU with Dr. Sheila Blair and holds the Norma Jean Calderwood University Professorship of Islamic and Asian Art at Boston College. Dr. Bloom is co-editor of 15 books on Islamic art including Paper Before Print, The History and Impact of Paper in the Islamic Lands, published by Yale University Press in 2001. Today, Dr. Bloom will present How Paper Changed Islamic Art, which resonates with my interest in the ways memory and social history become associated with materials and art objects, and how such narratives influence contemporary understandings of artistic production. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Bloom. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, friends. Um, it's lovely to see you all here. Um, as you know, I'm talking about a subject that's very close to my heart. And we'll start with something you've not seen before, of course. <laughs> One of the most famous illustration, illustrations from the most famous illustrated books of the Islamic Middle Ages comes from a celebrated copy of Hariri's Makamat or assemblies, transcribed and illustrated by Yahya al -Wasiti, um, it presumably at Baghdad in 1237, and now in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. It's a scene from the second Makama showing the narrator, al Harith, in a library in Basra. A group of men are reading poetry, and a scruffy old man who the narrator eventually recognizes as the rogue Abu Zaid, proceeds to, who proceeds to improve on the poetry the readers are reciting. Other renditions of this episode in other manuscripts of the Makamat um, also show the library, but their pictorial quality is generally not as fine, um, and particularly not in these awful black and white pictures. Although this may not have been true of the St. Petersburg manuscript, which is heavily damaged, but adds the interesting feature of a library ladder to allow one of the readers to reach the top shelves. 
From the perspective of this symposium, devoted to writing in Islamic art and civilization, what is striking about the Paris image is the number of the books on the shelves. And as I said yesterday, we're going to talk about the books and their bindings and why they're flat on the shelves, but I'm not going to say that today. I'm saving it for the next speaker. I count four tiers of nine cubbies, although the two in the upper corners are hidden by decorative spandrels. Each cubby holds between three and seven books, which means that there are about 200 books depicted on the shelves of the library in Basra. The name of this library is not specified, but it is not one of the great libraries celebrated in the historical texts, such as the Abbasid Library in Baghdad, which was built in 991 by the Persian Sabur ibn Ardashir, and was known variously as the House of Knowledge, Dar al Iyum, or the House of Books, Dar al Qutb. It contained over 10,000 volumes on a range of scientific subjects, but it was burned during the Seljuk invasion of Baghdad in 1055-56, and only a handful of books of its books were saved. According to the geographer al Muqaddisi, the library of the Buyid ruler, Adud al in Shiraz, was a large freestanding building consisting of a long vaulted hall on three sides, on three sides of which were suites of rooms. According to the librarian who took the geographer on a tour of the building in the mid 10th century, there were 360 rooms, one for every day of the year. Well, you know, I mean, a lot of rooms. The main hall and the side rooms contained carved wooden bookcases with doors. The books lay on shelves, one atop the other, much like those depicted in El Wasiti's illustration. The library of the Fatimid Caliphs in Cairo was also very large. In 993-94, the librarian of the Caliph al-Aziz, when requested, was able to produce 30 copies of Khalil ibn Ahmed's lexicographical mag masterpiece, Kitab al-Ain, including one in the hand of the author, as well as 20 copies of Tabari's history, multi-volume history, uh, the history of kings, uh, of, of um, prophets and kings, including an autograph copy, plus 100 copies of the Jamhara, a dictionary by the early 10th century lexicographer Ibn Durayd. In 1068-69, when the angry troops of the Fatimid Caliphs looted the palace, one storeroom yielded 18,000 volumes on the ancient sciences, whatever those were, and another contained 2,400 boxed manuscripts of the Quran written in proportion scripts, that is, the kind developed in Baghdad by Ibn Mukla and Ibn al buweb in the 10th century. An eyewitness to the looting saw 25 camels laden with books valued at 100,000 dinars headed to the house of, of a vizier who was owed money. Only two titles from the Fatimid library are known to survive. One, a manuscript of Al-Hajari's commentary, is split between Cairo and Kolkata in India. The other, a book on the genealogy of the Quraysh, was copied in Baghdad before 966, but bears a statement that it was still in the Fatimid royal library around 1150. Some two centuries earlier, the library of the Umayyad Caliph al-Hakam, who ruled in Cordoba from 961 to 976, is reported to have held an astounding 400,000 volumes. The catalog alone is said to have run to 44 volumes, and some scholars sat down and started figuring out how many titles would have had to be on each page of the catalog, and it's a lot. Only one book from the library a volume discovered in 1934 in the Karawin Mosque of Fez is known to survive. Approaching this subject from a somewhat different perspective, and, one, and the, uh, the 10th century bibliographer, um, Al-Waraq, Muhammad ibn Ishaq Al-Waraq, who was known as Ibn Abi Yaqub Al-Nadim, and about whom Hugh spoke yesterday. Oops, I'm just trying to adjust this a little bit. Yes. Um, compiled the Kitab al-Fihrist, a catalog or index of the books of all peoples, Arab and foreign, existing in the language of the Arabs, that he had seen himself or that had been reported to him by a trustworthy source. He organized these into 10 categories, as we heard yesterday, ranging from scripture, 
um, to grammar, history, biography, poetry, philosophy, law, and traditions. There were three categories of the secular subjects, philosophy and secular sciences, legends and fables, and doctrines of, and other religions, and finally, as Hugh had said, alchemy. In the English translation of Ibn al-Nadim's work, the index of the authors cited fills some 200 closely set pages with about 3,700 names, as far as I can tell. I sort of averaged it out. And we know that there were many other books on many other subjects that Ibn al-Nadim did not include, whether it was cookery, etiquette, or popular literature. By the end of the 10th century, virtually all of the scientific and philosophical works of Greek antiquity were available that would have had been available in late antiquity, including such topics as astrology, alchemy, mathematics, medicine, optics, and philosophy have been translated into Arabic. Western writers normally dismiss the extraordinary number of books cited in medieval Islamic libraries as examples of oriental exaggeration. Although they certainly accept that the ancient library of Alexandria contains somewhat, somewhere between 100,000 and 700,000 papyrus rolls, which were called volumen in, our, in Latin, comprising a lesser number of titles. I mean, for example, the Odyssey, was normally copied in 22 papyrus rolls, or books, or scrolls. And that's why we have book one of the Odyssey, book two of the Odyssey. They, it was actually how much you could get on a papyrus roll. All sources agree that the libraries of medieval Christendom were uniformly small. The famous depiction of the Jewish scribe priest Ezra from the Codex Amiatinus, a huge parchment manuscript produced at the monastery of Worm of Jarrow in Northumberland, at the end of the seventh century as a gift to the Pope in Rome, shows the scribe as an old man writing. In addition to the manuscript he is working on, there are another nine books in the bookcase behind him, which has doors to protect the, the books inside. In addition to the manuscript he is working on, there are another nine books. Um, and, uh, as, and these are opposed to the open shelves in the Arab library. In 841, the monastery at St. Gall in Switzerland held 400 volumes. In the early 1100s, the monastery of Bobbio in Italy held 650 volumes. By the early, 11, uh, by the early 1100s, the Benedictine monastery at Cluny in France, perhaps the wealthiest monastery in Europe, held just 570 volumes in its main library. The inventory of the small Byzantine monastery of Michael Ateliatis written in 1077, lists a total of 14 books. In the 14th century, the papal library at Avignon had barely 2,000 volumes. And the richest library in Christendom was said to be, have been the library of the Sorbonne in Paris. In 1338, it had only 338 books available for consultation, chained to reading desks, and 1,728 works for loan in its registers although 300 of them were listed as lost. The, the Biblioteca Malatestiana in Cesena in Italy, which I show you here, was built in the mid-15th century as the first municipal or public library in Europe. Originally, it had about 150 manuscripts chained to reading desks. Even after the invention of printing, books remained scarce. An inventory made at the great monastery of Clairvaux in 1506 records 1,788 manuscripts and only three printed books. Assuming that the Cordovan Library of four, 400,000 volumes had only one-tenth of the volumes of the books claimed, 40,000 instead of 400,000, it would still have surpassed any other European library by an order of magnitude. The extraordinary flourishing of books and book learning in the medieval Islamic lands was the result, therefore, of several factors. First, the general reverence for the written word in Islam, about which we've heard several others speak. Second, 
the extraordinary proliferation of manuscript books in an age before printing was made possible by a system of oral transmission through dictation, about which we've also heard a bit. Rather than copying a book from a single example that the scribe held in front of him, as Ezra was depicted doing in the Codex Amiotinus, in the Islamic lands, most books, at least initially in the classical period, were transmitted orally through dictation or recitation because taking dictation from someone reading or reciting aloud was generally considered more trustworthy than copying directly from a text. An author would sit, often in the mosque, and in the course of several sessions, read his work aloud or recite it to an assembled company who took dictation. When the reading was finished, the author checked the copies and gave his seal of approval. As 10 or more people could listen and copy simultaneously, it was an extremely effective um, method of publication in multiple copies. And with the, author's, uh, the original author's attestation, the copy could then be read by the copyist to another group of auditors, geometrically multiplying the number of copies of the original work. Thus, some of the numbers given in our medieval text, 30 copies of the Kitab al Ain, or 20 copies of Tabari's history, do not seem so outlandish when taking the nature of transmission into account. A fine example of this process can be seen in a manuscript now preserved in the Houghton Library at Harvard University. It consists of several sections of a commentary on the grammar of Abu, uh, Abu Bishr Amr ibn Uthman al-Basri, commonly known as Sibuwe, about who someone met, talked yesterday, who wrote in the late 8th century. By the t and the co this commentary is by the 10th century polymath Abu Sayyid Hassan ibn Abdallah Sirafi. The manuscript in, in, in question, the one you're seeing here, was copied presumably in Baghdad by one Abu Muhammad al Hassan ibn Ali al Madiani in the presence of Sirafi, the author, who approved and signed the copy. So this book must have been copied before 979 the year in which Serafi died. And you see his attestation right on the cover, on the uh, opening page. This manuscript also exemplifies the third factor that led to the explosion of books in medieval Islam, and that is the use and manufacture of paper. Paper, which had been invented in China in the centuries before Christ, is simply a thin mat of cellulose fibers that have been beaten in the presence of water, collected on a screen, and dried. Cellulose is found in most plants. A cotton ball, for example, is almost pure cellulose. So paper can be made almost anywhere plants grow, unlike papyrus, which was widely used in the ancient world, but which can only be made from the stalks of a plant native to Egypt. Parchment, the other writing material widely used in antiquity in the Middle Ages, is made from the skin of animals, especially sheep, goats, and cattle. It is strong and durable, but tends to be heavy. Like paper, it can be made almost anywhere. But it, as it requires the animal to surrender its skin, it is expensive. The Chinese usually made their paper from the raw or bast fibers taken from the inner bark of shrubs that grew in the moist and semi-tropical climate where paper was invented. But as paper manufacturers sp spread to other regions with different and drier climates, other sources of cellulose were developed whether plant materials such as flax and hemp, or waste from such materials such as rags and old ropes, sails, and fishing nets. Now we're going to try. I thought I'd just take a minute to show you just how paper is made. This video, which I made at the British Library this past spring, my first ever video, um, when the Islamic Manuscript Association sponsored a workshop on Islamic paper, shows my colleague, Luz Rodriguez, making paper with the help of Jacques Prejou, a master paper maker from Angoulême. The mold, which is made of vid bamboo or reed, sewn together with thread, sits on a wooden frame. It is dipped in the vat in which the fiber is dissolved, the mold is then drained, and the mold cover reversed to release the sheet. You see her now releasing the sheet, and now she's about to roll it up, and the teacher is going to come along and say, no, 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 that's not the way to do it. You just lift away. And you're removing, and there is the sheet of paper. Would you like to see that again? <laughs> Should we do it again? Yeah, okay, so dipping the mold here into the 
the vat that has the fiber floating in it. She's shaking it to, to get the fibers to knit together, and the water is draining out. And then she's lifting the mold, co the mold cover and reversing it into a stack, which is known as the post, and lowering it down gently. Um, and then lifting up this, removing the mold cover, and then eventually this stack of wet sheets would be um, pressed under a weight, human or otherwise, and one person in the audience will know what we're talking about, <laughs> and um, then separate the sheets. Okay. When Muslims conquered Central Asia in the late 7th century and the early 8th, they first encountered paper, which had been used there for centuries, for it had been brought there by Chinese Buddhists on their way to India to seek out Buddhist scriptures. Central Asian merchants adopted paper as it facilitated commerce. Some of the earliest paper documents to survive are a group of letters, um, of which I show you one, which are commonly known, oddly enough, as the ancient letters and they appear to have been the contents of a mailbag that was lost in the fourth or fifth century. The commonly repeated story about the supposed capture of Chinese papermakers at the Battle of Talas in 751, when the Muslims met the Chinese, is just that, a story. Told by the first told by the 11th century Arab historian of Thalami, who enumerated the specialties of different lands in his book of curious and entertaining information. So let's not keep repeating the story. According to him, paper was among the specialties of Samarkand when it was introduced by the Chinese prisoners captured by the Arabs at, at the battle. But for Thalabi, like other medieval Muslims, this was simply a way of saying that paper was invented in China and that the Muslims knew this. The use of paper in its manufacture quickly spread to the central Islamic lands, so that it was being made in Baghdad and Damascus by the end of the 8th century, and it's quickly spread from there, being manufactured as far as the Iberian Peninsula some two, decades, two centuries later. Therefore, paper, paper making traveled some 6,000 kilometers in just 300 years, which is an average rate of 20 kilometers a year. Uh, to me, this seems remarkable in medieval terms. Not only was paper cheaper than parchment and more widely producible than papyrus, but it had additional affordances or qualities that made it especially attractive to potential users. It was lighter than parchment and more flexible than papyrus, which couldn't stand up to repeated folding, such as happens in the uh, in choirs or in ledgers, a uh, uh, ledger or book. Writing on paper was also more secure than on either parchment or papyrus, for both could be easily erased. Even though Islamic paper was sized or coated with starch and polished to provide a smooth surface for writing on both sides of the sheet, ink still soaked into the fibers so that any attempt at erasure was noticeable. This made paper perfect for bureaucrats, and the introduction to paper in the Islamic lands coincided with the explosion of the Abbasid bureaucracy about which Hugh spoke yesterday, that was charged with administering an empire that stretched, if only nominally, from the Atlantic to the Indian Oceans and from the Sahara to the Central Asian steppes. Once bureaucrats were comfortable with paper, its use soon spread to other groups in society, whether writers on subjects ranging from theology to astrology or to Christian and Jewish writers who used it as quickly as their Muslim brethren. The oldest known manuscript on Arab paper is actually a Greek manuscript of the teachings of the early church fathers, the Doctrina Patrum, which was produced at Damascus around 800, and the Jewish merchants whose writings were collected in the Cairo Geniza, a storeroom of discarded papers, used paper as readily as did Muslim merchants. Probably the oldest dated book on Arabic paper, on, uh, Arabic book on paper is an incomplete copy of the Gharib al-Hadith, a work on unusual terms in the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad by Abu Ubaid al-Qasim ibn Salam Baghdadi, who died in 837, which is now in the Leiden University Library. It is dated to 866 and written in a serviceable proto-cursive script on brown paper. <coughs> The 
The World Survey of Islamic Manuscripts estimated, estimates that about three million Islamic manuscripts have survived from the 14 centuries before the widespread adoption of printing in the Muslim world. And this number must, only, must represent only a mere fraction of the manuscripts originally produced, thanks to the general acceptance of paper and the system of dictating texts. Paper encouraged the transition from the oral culture of pre and early Islamic times to the written culture of later times, about which Dan spoke yesterday. Paper also allowed authors to write in new and different ways, just as the personal computer allows us to write very differently than we did when we used to use when we use typewriters or pens and pencils. The author Ibn Taus, who died in 1266 in Baghdad, explains that he was too busy with other matters to be able to work in the usual fashion. Instead, he employed a copyist, a nasikh, in two ways. Either Ibn Taus would jot down his ideas on slips of paper, which the nasikh would copy at once, or when citing from written texts, Ibn Taus would either dictate to the copyist from the original book or show him the passage which he wanted copied and the copyist would write it down. The individual folios produced by the copyist did not follow any particular order and may be compared to index cards. The next step was for Ibn Taus to take each complete folio and copy its text into the appropriate place in the final version of the book. <coughs> We actually know quite a bit about the working methods of one of the best known historians of the Mamluk period, Taqiyuddin Ali ibn Ali, uh, Ali ibn uh, al makrizi who died in 1442. Several of Makrizi's notebooks have survived, along with drafts of books he wrote and books that he owned. They show that he composed an old he composed on old Mamluk chancery documents, which may have had some some text. Uh, on them, but also a lot of white space. These had been sold as scrap paper to paper merchants who cut them into pieces, approximately 275 by 185 millimeters, or 10, a little, uh, almost 11 by 7 inches, so almost as large as sheet A4 or typing paper, folded them in half and resold them in the form of choirs. As he read, Al Makrizi would take notes in these unbound choirs in no particular order, avoiding the, the text, and you can see where the red circle is, is the old text. And for those of you who don't know what a document, uh, what a chancery document, this is one of the Fatimid documents that I think Hugh mentioned yesterday, um, w which is from Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai and um, from the um, 12th century. And you can see how much white space there was. And you can also see the hand coming down at the top, which gives you some idea of the size of the sheet and how much white space there was. And this wasn't because paper was so cheap, it was because rulers were so rich and wanted to show off how much paper they could afford to waste. Macrisi might leave spaces between his notes for later additions or corrections, and sometimes he added pieces of colored paper containing supplementary text, somewhat like an early form of post-it notes. And this was a, this is a manuscript of, of, of um, uh, I think Macrisi's chit, yeah, Macrisi's chitat, um, uh, in his own handwriting with, um, with his post-it notes and marginal notes, additions and corrections uh, that's in the University of Michigan Library. Muslim cal calligraphers tasked with copying the Quran, however, were not initially eager to use paper, and they continued to use parchment well into the 10th century. Gradually, however, over the course of the 10th century, particularly in Iran and Iraq, calligraphers began to accept the permanence and affordances of the medium, developing new scripts for copying sacred scripture, and eventually ab abandoning the horizontal landscape format previously used for parchment manuscripts of the Quran, and adopting the portrait format heretofore used for ordinary books. The key monument of this development is the single volume copy of the Quran penned in a perfectly legible Nas script in brown-black ink on brownish paper by Ali ibn Hilal, known as Ibn al bawab in Baghdad in 1001, and now in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. And I have to say, I think that the Chester Beatty Library has won the, the, um, the numerical, it's been cited more often than any other library <laughs> um, in these two days, probably for good reason. In the Western Islamic lands, however, 
calligraphers continued to produce manuscripts of the Quran on parchment, although paper was widely used for other types of books. Over the course of the following centuries, the quality of the paper improved. Paper makers were able to make larger, whiter, and finer sheets, so that by the 14th century, particularly in the greater Iranian world, large luxury manuscripts were produced on sheets that measured 50 by 70 centimeters or even 70 by 100 centimeters, about the size of the largest mold that a single paper maker could lift out of the vat. It is unclear why this happened, whether through increased contact with China during the Mongol period or because of technological developments in the processing of fibers. Although papermakers could make white papers, no mean feat in an age before bleach, calligraphers generally preferred to write on slightly tinted tones or even darker colors. Eventually, artists developed all sorts of techniques for developing paper, dec for decorating paper, whether through sprinkling the finished sheets with gold leaf flecks, as you see on the right, uh, stenciling or marbling the surface, as you see on the left. In this way, the medium of paper sometimes became the work of art itself. In the remaining time, I want to briefly consider some other ways it, it, some, beyond language in which the medium of paper transformed Islamic culture. Unfortunately, there's no time to explore how the availability of paper facilitated and encouraged the notation of uh, other activities, such as commercial transactions, mathematical calculations. As Hugh mentioned, the, um, the uh, adoption of Arabic, uh, what we call Arabic, but Indian numerals, or cartography. But as an art historian, I do want to mention the impact of paper on the visual arts in the Islamic lands. From my research, it seems that paper had little impact on the visual arts in the 9th and 10th centuries, just when it was transforming literary culture, apart from the development of scripts that took advantage of the medium's qualities or affordances. This may be because paper, although it was cheap, was still too expensive to be used by artists who occupied a much lower social position than did calligraphers and who would have continued to practice such activities as drawing on reusable or washable flat surfaces such as boards or the backs of tiles. Remember, even in the 15th century, al makrizi was buying um, uh, choirs made from old chancery documents, so paper wasn't all that cheap. In the early period, artists worked directly on their given medium, as in this 9th century bowl found at Cairo and in Tunisia, where the design was painted directly on the surface of the object. One of the most obvious artistic uses of paper was, of course, as a support for illustrations. And you can go upstairs in the museum and see many examples of this. And much scholarly attention has recently focused on the emergence of the illustrated book in the Islamic lands. Some scholars have proposed that the Islamic illustrated book is a direct continuation of the classical tradition of illustrated books on papyrus or parchment, although we do not have any early Islamic examples, apart from a very few citations in some historical texts that mention special books with pictures. Certainly some types of books um, produced already in the 9th and 10th centuries, such as works on astronomy or geography, would have needed illustrations and undoubtedly had them. But there is a virtual explosion of illustrated books in the 11th and 12th centuries, exactly the moment when we have seen that the quality of the paper made in the Muslim world improved dramatically as papermakers were able to make larger, whiter, and finer sheets. To my mind, the growing number of illustrated books is not merely an accident of survival. It seems to be, to be no coincidence that this process culminates in the 13th century in Iran and Iraq as the art of representation shifts from the ceramic surface to the arts of the book. And I'll just show you, I don't know if you can see, but this is a, uh, and I didn't want to spend too much time on it, but this is a bowl, a very large bowl in the David collection with a schoolhouse scene. And they're all learning to write their ABCs. And what's very interesting is it's both boys and girls who are being taught in this classroom. So co-ed education is not a new thing. Um, the ceramic representation shifts from the, um, 
uh, or uh, representation shifts from the ceramic surface to the arts of the book. To put it another way, before the 13th century, if you had artistic ability and were a good draftsman, you went into the pottery business. After that time, you went into illustrating books. And the art of the illustrated book becomes the major art form in much of the Muslim world, especially from Iran to the Ottoman Empire, Central Asia, and India in the four centuries after 1300. And that's basically in one sentence we've talked about <laughs> um, a, a, an entire, I don't know, year's course in Islamic art. Um, another way in which the availability of paper transformed Islamic visual culture is through the development of systems of notating architecture. Although most of us today consider reading an arch architectural plan to be an innate skill, any professor who teaches an introductory survey course knows that it's really a learned language in which the experience of three-dimensional space is encoded and decoded in two-dimensional representations. There is little or no evidence that builders in the Islamic lands in the first centuries of Islam knew of or used plans or representations. Architectural knowledge was conveyed from one builder to, uh, and site to another builder and site by gesture and memory. Occasionally, verbal descriptions played a role, but medieval Arabic descriptions of architecture are usually so vague that it's difficult to imagine that any builder could learn much of practical use, apart from dimensions and numbers, from them. We tend to forget, in our graphic world, how artisans were able to work directly in their chosen materials without having to do preliminary drawings in other media. For example, there's no reason to think that any part of the Mosque of Cordova, one of the great examples of early Islamic architecture, was designed or built using paper plans. In the period after 1300, however, we, see we read increasingly of actual plans being sent from one place to another. And this is the period where one can increasingly see consistencies of architectural style over great distances, suggesting not only that builders may have moved from one place to another, but also that they started using plans, presumably drawn on paper. The earliest surviving examples of plans may date from the 15th century. And it is inconceivable that any of the great works of later Islamic architecture, such as the Suleimani Mosque in Istanbul or the Taj Mahal in Agra, could have been designed without recourse to paper plans. And it is furthermore impossible to imagine that Amanat Khan, who designed the magnificent epigraphic program of the Taj Mahal, didn't write his inscriptions out on paper, whether small or full scale, before these cartoons were given to marble workers to inlay in black marble on white. So to conclude, I can do no better than to repeat a remark made over a century ago by the Austrian Orientalist, Alfred von Kremer, who lived from 1828 to 1889. From a cultural and historical point of view, he wrote, the reduction in the cost of writing material, which went hand in hand with the production of paper, was of great importance. By the production of a cheap writing material and its supply to markets, both east and west, the Arabs made learning accessible to all. It ceased to be the privilege of only one class, initiating that blossoming of mental activity that burst the chains of fanaticism, superstition, and despotism. So started a new era of civilization, the one we live in now. Thank you.